Good evening. Um, <clears throat> today is November 6, 2023. This is a meeting of the City of Northampton uh, Board of Health. Um, tonight we have board members Cynthia Swopis and Suzanne Smith and myself, Joanne Levin. Absent tonight are Dallas Ducar and Janet Grant. We also have staff Meredith Leary, O'Leary, uh, Amy Hutchins, and Kelly Constantine. Um, so before we uh, officially open the meeting, we will have a time for a public comment session. Is anyone here for public comment? Please raise your electronic hand. I see one person in the audience. If you're here for public comment, um, please raise your hand. All right, seeing none, we will move on. Um, would someone like to make a motion? Uh, move to open the meeting. Second. Any discussion? All in favor, Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Okay, we are now in the uh, Northampton Board of Health meeting starting at 5.33. Um, and this meeting will, is being recorded. Um, the first item that was on the agenda is a variance request. Um, uh, is that person, Brittany? Do we know? No, that, that's not Brittany. Um, that's not Brittany. Okay. No. No. Okay. So you just decided that uh, this person does not need a variance, variance Correct. and we are going to skip over this. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I know, Meredith, you sent out some things at like after four o'clock today. <laughs> um, but do you want to introduce the subject? This is um, a subject we've talked a little bit about before, but uh, Meredith has some more information. Yeah. So, you know, I think when you've all talked in the past about projects, um, Board of Health policy projects, this has come up, you know, there is a slew of synthetically derived cannab cannabinoids, um, psychotropic substances. Um, I, I don't even know if there's one umbrella that really fits everything under it nicely, but these harmful substances that are saturating our retailer stores. Um, there is a community in actually Belchertown just last week had a Board of Health hearing with some draft regulations um, that Cheryl had sent them, had wrote to them about prohibiting these certain products. They didn't make a motion. They tabled uh, the hearing uh, until next Board of Health meeting until they have more information. So I sent you their regulations so you could review them ahead of time. Today, I found um, a bunch of information about the stance of the FDA on Kratom. Um, Amy had provided a document about um, MDAR, how MDAR views Delta-8. The long story short, is these products come from a natural plant, but are synthetically made from the natural plant. And there's not enough known about them and they are all unregulated. Um, Cheryl Sabara, which I think we should have come to a meeting in the future. I hope you all had an opportunity to listen to her, uh, the video, the presentation that I sent you earlier this week. She is unsure because it's kind of unprecedented if boards of health who are going to regulate first, her first statement is if you're going to regulate, make sure you have the resources and the infrastructure to do something about it. Right. A regulation is only as good as you have the resources for enforcement. So that's number one. But number two, she says, if it's a straight out prohibition, she does fear there might be some legal action. Again, this is unprecedented. Um, number three, at a minimum, if you're going to regulate, at least you should have an age restriction on these products and a placement restriction. And that placement should be um, where it's not, where you can't get the item yourself. It needs to be behind a counter or locked. Um, I think it's, they call it a self-service display. Like you can't have that. 
Um, so I think, you know, as a board, we need to start talking about these products. Donna um, and Angelica, Amy's environmental health team, inspectional team, went out earlier today and yesterday just to kind of do a quick assessment of the products that we have in our stores. And I sent that link to you about a half an hour ago, but I can open it up on my screen and share my screen so we can all look at it, look at it one time. Um, Thank you for doing that. Yeah, no, thank Don. I, it was a last minute ask and they got right to it. So let me share my screen. And I would add Donna always is tracking that. So even though she, she went back out, she's got her eye on what's out there pretty regularly. So she goes only to tobacco stores, places that sell tobacco, but there are other stores who may be selling these things. These would be, Joanne, like a Cumberland Farms or a Pride. It doesn't have to be a tobacco shop. Oh, she can look at other shops? Mm-hmm. Like, it, okay. like, you know, really like a Northampton market or, or it could be, I mean, they really could do mm -hmm. it in CVS, but that's not where they are. So. Right. So can you all see my screen? Yep. Okay. Um, and it's a decent size. Yes. yes yeah. Good. Okay. So she, she listed um, the products individually and then just kind of again you know quick overview a quick assessment what's in there what's not in there and you can see and when i looked at this today the first one that comes up is bird store has i say kratom but after i listened to um the uh board of health meeting last week in Be in belchertown they say crate tom crate tom crate tom so i don't know if i'm pronouncing it right <laughs> or wrong but anyways you can see they have Meredith. Could you just could you just go through the top what those different drugs are and like CBD tobacco uh, and CBD gummies? Just what the issues are with each of those things. So, um, sort of maybe um, C CBD tobacco and CBD gummies, um, and and I'm not sure if I have this totally correct. Still, this might have been updated, but. CBD itself, um, Amy, help me out with this, is not legal. Not a food additive, right? I need help on this one. Yeah, it's uh, uh, Donna is really our subject matter expert. Um, um, maybe we didn't need her on the meeting then. Yeah, CBD. I, I so think I think CBD is not an approved food additive. So that's why the gummies are... She's looking at the gummies, but CBD tobacco, do we regulate that only nicotine products can be sold in tobacco stores? No, no. I think the CBD area is a whole big um, hmm. uh, area of confusion. Um, as, as I understood what Cheryl was saying in her presentation is that if we move to, to the right here, these Delta-8, um, the Delta-8 uh, synthetic cannabinoids that are out there or, or synthetic THC. Um, the reason that they're not legal is because they are not really derived from natural products. They have to be altered chemically. Um, it, you can get Delta-8, but you have to um, use hundreds of thousands of pounds of THC in order to get it. So it has to be altered in the lab and anything that's altered in the lab is not considered THC Temp. or yeah. allowable. Now, CBD, as I understand it, also falls into that category of it has to be chemically altered before it you can get enough or, or to have enough um, to be used. We know that this is everywhere and everywhere all over Northampton. And um, I think we have just learned to live with it to this point. So, right. So what I do know, and actually Donna is on and we'll, we'll have her speak. She's a breezy iPhone. Okay. Um, right. What I do know is that there was a time, and again, I'm not as current on this as I should be, that CBD was not 
legal. There was no CBD manufacturing plant in Massachusetts that was allowed to sell to retail stores. Therefore, all of the CBD that was coming into Massachusetts was through interstate commerce, which was illegal. So way back when, I think it was 2018 or 19, we asked all of our stores to take these voluntarily to take these products off their shelf. And they did all with the exception of one, which they eventually did too. But I think MDAR has since now um, approved um, manufacturing plants in Massachusetts, and it may be legal, but I'll definitely want to check on that. But for the CBD gummies, why that's an issue is that is gummies is an uh, would be food that's been adulterated. So that's why that would not be legal. I'm not sure about the tobacco, but Donna, if you can... Come on, I think you can unmute yourself. That's to unmute. Okay, can you hear me? We can hear you now, yeah. Oh. Hey everyone. Okay, so the question is, is whether the CBD in tobacco? Yeah, is yeah. So MDAR did do, uh, they did uh, recently, uh, actually, I think it was about a year and a half, two years ago, did come out with an explanation on CBD and tobacco. Um, and the CBD in general, cannabinoids, um, all of them are not, have not been federally or, or locally regulated. So they don't have a lot of, 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 of um, literature on it. Um, they did a small one, one and a half page uh, um, mailing uh, a, a little while back. Uh, kind of explaining why they feel it's it, it's it, it's uh, it's uh, you know not been added to codes or to regulations yet, but um, at at this point, not, none of them have been have been regulated to be to be on the market. So it's really more of a warning than a than a okay, you can't do it. Okay, I think some of those sales have snuck snuck back onto the counters, Meredith. Oh, I know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's just it's it's just very common, and a lot of people use it, and a lot of the people, a lot of the um, stores that sell um, supplements have various strengths of it available. So we we we've known about it and haven't decided to act, to my knowledge. Uh, and the. The material that Cheryl was talking about, I think, was from last year sometime, and I didn't know if what she had been talking about was updated. So I would be very interested in hearing what she has to say, that it's uh, an update of that video. I thought that CBD was usable since the Farm Bill said that if hemp a hemp derived product has less than 0.03% THC, then it is not considered marijuana and therefore it was okay. Right, they separated marijuana from hemp. It's the same issue with the Delta 8. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we could definitely use um someone who really has a strong background in these products to help explain them. But what I immediately texted Donna when I saw Bird's store is that they're selling THC products. There were a couple of others, weren't there? Yeah. yeah Jennifer, can we have that, that, can we have that page back up, please? Oh, you can't see it anymore? No. No, there's something else in the way. Scroll down. I think we're still up. How about now? There you go. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there are three of them. So How can that be? There's, yeah, four. more than that. Oh, more, yeah. more. How can that be? I don't know. I mean, it's it's not, it's up to the police. It's a, it's a drug. It's a scheduled drug. I wonder if there's something that's being mi is mislabeled. I, I don't know because the Cannabis Control Commission would frown upon that. There was a comment in uh, Donna's prison and uh, Cheryl's presentation about being unclear about how well the Cannabis Commission is is monitoring right. things like this. Well, it's 
if only for the license. I mean, we have not licensed any, um, we haven't given any cannabis licenses in Northampton to any facility that is open, that sells anything else, correct? Correct, correct, so, right. So the Cannabis Control Commission only inspects the licensed establishment. They wouldn't go to all the convenience stores and right. look for products. So they would be selling THC, if it's true that these particular stores are selling THC, they're selling it without a license. Correct. They're selling it illegally. And I think, Donna, you said that they were selling joints, they were selling vape, so they were selling flower vape products. That is wow. correct. That is correct. Well, there's a problem. Isn't THC, uh, they're selling, I'm going to, say strict THC or THC or products that contain THC. Is there a difference? Uh, all the THC. There are differences. They're, they're you know, straightforward marijuana, marijuana. And then there's also products that contain the THC. So you're talking electronic cigarettes. You're talking just uh, jars of what they call bud, which is actually marijuana in its, in its dried form. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, they have it in pills, they have it in, in, in tinctures, so they, they can have it in different ways. A lot of them are natural THC and, 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 and but most of them now are synthetic. So when you, when you say, um, Donna, they, um, sort of that's the marketplace or, or is this happening when we see THC at bird store, in what format are we seeing it? We're seeing it in e-cigarettes. Okay. Uh, most e-cigarettes um, is what we're seeing it in now uh, uh -huh. in Northampton is mostly e-cigarettes e and, and small uh, and bud. So in the, in the small jars. Um, in these stores that do not have cannabis licenses. That's correct. So oh, whose jurisdiction would this be if, uh, would this be the police or wh whose jurisdiction would this be in? The, I would, I the would licenses imagine. are given by the Cannabis Commission, but have to be approved by City Council, correct? Well, uh, I think eventually, but none of these are licensed. Right. None of these. Right. Yeah. That's That was the so, point, is that they're operating without a license. Wherever the license comes from, they're operating without a license if they're selling THC. Right. And they wouldn't be able to get a license because if you're selling THC, you can't sell other products. And we would not be getting the taxes that need yeah. to be paid by THC sellers. Mm hmm. Yeah. Right. And in fact, just so you're aware, I in the last, I say three months or so, we've done a lot of, not in Northampton, but we've done a lot of, the, the tobacco control has done a lot of um, um, uh, raids and busts in other communities surrounding us. And every time these things happen, those products are taken off the shelf and confiscated. Uh, and the busts or the raids were for what specifically, Donna? Well, they they have they they go in for different reasons, but when we get yeah. into the tobacco shops, they end up taking all the illegal products, and and many times those are are, are what the 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 most of what goes out of the store. So, do we have the ability to do that when we go into the store just to do a regular check? It, they go in with police. Donna, isn't that correct? Correct. Yeah, we we don't have the authority to confiscate anything. Uh -huh. um, whether the state and the police do. I would think there would be penalties for selling THC, legal penalties, if not fines for selling THC without a license. I'm not sure what the outcomes were. You would think the Cannabis Control Commission would have a comment on that. I would think so. And the police department, right? I mean, and, and can someone tell me what Delta 8 or 9 is? What What is in Delta 8? 
Delta-8 Delta is the synthetic cannabinoid that there's a very small design. amount of it in marijuana, yeah. but it's then, then augmented. It's, it's made synthetically and is also um, has um, psychogenic properties like THC. Okay. The actual marijuana is Delta-9. It's just the, the chemical nature. Uh, so the real marijuana in THC, I think, is called Delta-9. And the synthetics are Delta-8. There's also a Delta-10, and there's some other ones that yes. are made synthetically. That, that handout that Mary just, just sent was talking about some, yeah. Yeah. And I don't know that last category. Do you know, anyone know what that is? HHC? Donna does. She's still with us. Donna? Um, while we're waiting, I, I just quickly looked up on the phone and this source says that um, for first offenders, um, selling less than 50 pounds of marijuana is punishable by a fine of $500 to $5,000. Now, I have no idea if selling it in a store like this is just like, um, is, would be just the same as arresting somebody on the street with a s significant quantity of, of THC. I mean, that's still illegal. You can grow, grow for yourself, but um, selling on the street is um, is illegal. Um, let's see. Personal use with intent to distribute. There are fines. There are prison sentences at a certain level of, of volume. It's a felony. In Massachusetts, Susie? yes. I'm looking in Massachusetts laws and. And penalties on under the normal website. I recognize that's a pro marijuana organization, mm -hmm. but the I think that the point is that even according to them, there are uh, there's a potential for substantial fines and, and penalties for sale without a license. Would the fines come from the Cannabis Control Commission, Suzanne, or no? I don't know. I I, I have. Or a, just be like this, Chapter Forty D fines. This, uh, I this this sounds like the legal arena rather than the um, Cannabis Control Commission, but I don't know, Meredith. Right. Okay. Hey guys, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, I missed I missed that. I was I had to step out for a second. Um, so the the HHC on the end, that's it's 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 a hexahydrocannabinol, uh, um, which is kind of and it's a long word. And it's got to be twenty letters. It's a uh, it's 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 part of the delta the delta eight. It's a it's a it's a derivative of of uh, of uh, cannabis, which is in like the sativa mm -hmm. family. So, and the sativa is is a type of of cannabis. Um, but the the HHC is more along the lines of the synthetic side of things, um, which is why it's so it's so it's so unknown right now um, because it, it it's so new, um, and and it has a kind of a psychoactive um, reaction when you use it. Uh, it's mild and I guess a shorter term, but uh, but it's it definitely gives you uh, you know a, a a high sense you know when, when you're using it. Here's another site. Selling less than 50 pounds of marijuana is not classified as a type of felony or misdemeanor, but depending on the number of prior offenses, the fine ranges from $5,000 to $10,000. And there can be jail sentences as well. I, I, I don't think there's much doubt that it's a crime of But all of these products, <clears throat> the way they're listed here, sorry, I'm sort of embarrassed that I have to ask questions about something I know little about, but um, they could be sold in a um, licensed um, facility like we have in, in, in the city. Not uh, Delta 8. Not Delta 8. No. I don't think so. No. 
Um, so not so any synthetics. Okay. So <laughs> these and we know they sell CBD products. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, these these synthetic products are are pretty new to the scene. Um and there's just not a, enough research on them, on any of them. Um, you know, I I sent you the FDA link to Kratom a little earlier, and the FDA came out with a statement warning consumers not to use Kratom because of the risk of serious adverse effects, including liver toxicity, seizures, substance use disorder, and rare case deaths have been associated with Kratom as well. Um, so I think there's, they're just unknown and, you know, then you take a synthetic substance and add alcohol to it. I mean, there are, I sent you some, um, some journals that it's just a combination for, um, just adverse consequences. So the the real i think the real question at hand i mean because there are you know there is an american kratom association i there is going to be pushback from large you know large companies i imagine like we see with tobacco um if we regulate this or if we prohibit it but I think in the meantime, until we have more information, if we can just make sure that it's not getting in the hands of youth, that would be a great step. I was talking to Joanne the other day, and I know creating a regulation, you know, doesn't happen overnight. Our next meeting's December. By the time we get something passed, it could be February, you know, January, February. The latest is what I was thinking about doing, which there's precedence for, because we've done it in the past twice with CBD and we've done it with bath salts. I think that was back in 2016 when the bath salts hit the scene and was turning people into zombies. Um, I sent a letter out to all the establishments that I knew that were selling these products and asked them to voluntarily take them off. And um, again, everyone who had bath salts did at the time. And then with CBD, everybody did except for one store, but they eventually in the end took them all of their establishments as well. I feel like CBD, um, when we're talking about um, public health and risk of harm is, you know, I, I don't see anything wrong with it. It's in everything. Um, so I feel like it's very low priority at this point. It was a more about the interstate commerce back then. Um, and it just being infused into food products that, you know, violated the food code, but the lotions, what, you know, um, the other products that weren't food or are not food, we don't regulate those types of products anyways. So that's the CBD products that you're seeing right now in the product. There might be food products that have re-entered since we used to do regular inspections for them. But again, I feel like it's the risk of harm of CBD is really little to none. Um, but these other products, um, I feel like have a potential for, for harm. And the 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 gentleman who will eventually, if it makes it on our agenda and we have draft regulations, is going to come on and talk about, um, you know, how many Americans use Kratom, the three kind of buckets that are it, it's being used for, and that there's a John Hopkins survey out there where a small percent of them say it actually helps them. Um, with relief from suffering and pain, but he doesn't cite, you know, of course, and he's not going to cite the research out there that people are actually addicted, have become addicted to Kratom. Um, and I think, Suzanne, you sent an email out uh, last week saying you're actually treating people um, with Kratom use disorder. 
Right. It's it's a handful of people. Mm -hmm. I think a couple people currently. Um, we there's no doubt in my mind that people experience uh, relief of pain from kratom, but it would be the same thing as if they went out and you know bought fentanyl on the street. They would experience relief from pain from that too. Um, but this is this is a substance that that has broader effects than opioids. It has stimulant effects as well. Um, and people can suffer consequences of, of too many stimulants from taking them. And it works on the same receptors as opioids. It, it worked on the opioid receptor. So that's why people have pain relief, but it has the same long-term problems that using any um, substance that stimulates the opioid use re the opioid receptor with use you become dependent with long term use. Suzanne, do you use, do you treat them with the same uh, modalities that you use for opioid addiction? We do. I don't think. The knowledge is, um, well, I, I, let me, let me roll that back. I'm not sure I want to say that, but we, we have not seen that many people, but we do know that it can cause, a, a, a dependence with time. So Meredith, um, do you have a proposal for uh, the letter that you would write to these establishments? Would you be asking them to voluntarily put their Kratom and their Delta-8 behind the counter and have an age restriction? Yeah, I want to I wanna definitely um, bring Cheryl into the loop about their thoughts because if we're if we are asking that, are we saying that it's okay to sell it? So I just want to make sure legally um, that that's a recommendation um, before we do. And I've also asked attorney Seawald for his opinion on that as well. And did you have a proposal for what to do about the THC? Did you ask Cheryl or no. attorney Seawald? No, no. Mm -mm. Hey, Donna, I have a question for you. When you went into different communities um, by request that had these products, were they just, were the products seized and embargoed? Do you, or do you know if there were any fines imposed as well? Uh, they, they, all of them were seized and embargoed, but whether uh, the, the cities or the municipalities themselves uh, fined for those products, is unknown. They they usually don't give me the details. They give me the details of the fine, but not the breakdown of what the fines were. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Also, just to let you know, um, I reached out to the Northwestern District Attorney Dave Sullivan because he did write a statement um, and provided it to the Belchertown Board of Health, um, agreeing that these products should be listed under the, uh, I don't have the, the statement with me, but um, um, as a scheduled drug and should be regulated. Think, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Cynthia. We're in this murky area of waiting for guidance on policy and should we or shouldn't we. Um, do we have any obligation to the community to warn uh, parents or, or anyone about what we're seeing? Yeah, I, I, I think people don't know that these products are in the store. People who don't know unless they, you know, they're actively seeking these products. Um, the common person, the labor person does not know what these products are and the harm that they could, that they could cause. 
I think if we have any thoughts of moving towards regulation in the future, that we need to step very carefully into the sequence of events. Um, you know, I if um, district attorneys willing to have his letter um, published or there's a statement about that, that would be that would be helpful. But um, we're we're probably going to get um, a response to any negative statement that we might make about these products. And we'd better be standing on solid ground if we're gonna make statements about the potential danger or harm. Is that because Suzanne, the science is still out on that? There's not that much science about them. Yeah, is that your reason for being sort of temp tempered there? I think it comes from my experience of um, even trying to remove vape products or any of the um, any of the ways that we have moved towards these um, addictive substances, we we have to be careful how we make our warnings to the public and assure that at least what we we know what we're talking about when we do it. I mean, there's there's a there are a number of bits of information here that have been pulled together about uh, potential harm, but I'm not sure what the state. I also re recall from um, Cheryl's video that there at that time when she gave that presentation, I think it was maybe August, that there was debate as to whether um, Delta 8, for example, was illegal or it wasn't illegal. Mm -hmm. um, there was debate between the agriculture department and um, uh, a, as, as I recall, um, an appellate court in in uh, elsewhere in the country had ruled that it could be sold. So I, I, it, it's it feels like a real murky area for me, and I would want to assure that we could defend forever going forward, anything we put into a statement cautioning the public. I agree. And I mean, I, I do feel that, you know, we have both the FDA and the CDC have issued warnings of serious adverse events related to Delta-8. And with, you know, the Northwestern District Attorney's statement, I feel like we have some solid ground to at least start moving the needle in the right direction. For I Delta hate 8. that. Yeah, for Delta 8. For, and, for Delta 8, okay. Yeah. I hate that, um, you know, this falls under our umbrella to regulate and enforce. Um, but it looks like that's the direction that this is going in. And I think we're going to see, um, just like we did with, with tobacco way back when, that we need to have some leaders in Massachusetts, you know, some board of health that are progressive to take this on, and then we'll see others follow suit. This is not unique to just Northampton. I mean, West Springfield is saturated. Donna has the luxury of going into, I think, 47 different communities across um, Franklin, Hampshire, and Hampden County to do um, tobacco inspections and probably can confirm that she sees this in all of the in the communities and all of the stores. Did we not get a draft of language from Belchertown? We did. About a regulation? Yeah. So would we want to move directly towards potential regulation? But once again, in areas like these, I always look to Cheryl's counsel. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's a big harm in putting out 
information just the way we've received it, our thoughts, you know, from the CDC, from the FDA, like just, just the same information that we've received that there's, you know, it's unclear whether it's legal or not, but it, it has potential for harm. I, I don't think there's a downside to that. We need to be, we're going to have to do public education as to what it even is. We right. Delta eight is dangerous. People don't have the faintest idea what that is. Mm -hmm. But maybe, and then, sorry. And then we're talking, so we're, then we're actually talking about the category of synthetic uh, cannabinoids. So, um, I, it, I don't have I don't have any problem of um, of uh, repeating what FDA or CDC has done. I just think we need to it needs to be explained what we're talking about and why. Um, and as as I look at what I could see the chart, the Delta eights, to me, a lesser problem than um, illegal sales of THC and Kratom. Those, if we're talking about priorities, those are higher priorities in my book. So you have more hidden down there, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, I, um... I understand the hesitancy, but I'm wondering if the, what Meredith mentioned earlier, um, the sort of appealing one-on-one -on -one to these stores, um, uh, as we did in the past, and also I'm thinking of the health, I, I don't know if I have this acronym right, but or this name right, the Health Advisory Committee that I think you're on, Meredith, for the schools, mm -hmm. um, to, to let the schools um, at least know <laughs> um, with the same kind of murky information that we have, but trying to get more information. It's difficult for me to believe DPH doesn't give us any guidance or, or there's no one that we can go to there. No. I mean, no. It's just so interesting. <laughs> Meeting with Heather Warner uh, yeah. next Tuesday. I feel like if there's anyone in the area that will have a handle on this, she will. Um and isn't she due to do a new? Uh, What's that? Isn't she due to um, do to do a new report in the schools? I think they do it every that's every every other year report. What the, the students? The PNAS. Yeah. Uh, it just came out. I think this year. I think they do it every other year, Cynthia. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. uh, it it tells us what the students are experiencing. Yeah. In terms yeah. Of, uh, yeah. These yeah. these projects. I'd hate to think that little Northampton, even though we've been progressive in the past, I certainly don't want to continue that way, that we're the only ones, you know, that have to forge this path forward. This is so silly. <laughs> but I appreciate, you know, you bringing it up, just wondering how we, how we can keep. Yeah, I think Cheryl's the, the one piece there, for sure. Mm -hmm. So, well, Meredith, do you know what Belchertown is planning? I, uh, I believe that, um, so they had a, they were prohibiting in their regulation. And, um, I said, I, I forgot, I spoke up and I said at a minimum, you know, because I was afraid of a potential lawsuit, which I didn't say to them that, um, while they're considering or deliberating or discussion discussing this, um, perhaps a way to look at this is, you know, maybe phase it in. And the first step is to prohibit it um, for minors, anyone under 21 and don't have any self-service. So I think that's where they left it at the end of the meeting. And then we're gonna come back next month. So does anyone have any thoughts on on how you'd like to proceed? 
Well, I'm assuming Cheryl's, Cheryl's going to be contacted by somebody. I'm not sure. I will contact but, Cheryl, yeah. Uh, do we want to do what you suggested earlier, Meredith, uh, advising the stores? So, yeah, um, let me let me get some responses from both Cheryl and Alan about that. Because if we're going to regulate, and I don't know if we're considering regulating, you know, age restriction and placement, product placement, or just prohibit them from the stores, I feel like if we're asking them to secure them and require identification um, to be 21 or older, that that could um, put us in a, a funky spot. So I just want to be really super clear based on the direction we may go. I guess my, my next question is, can a 10-year-old purchase any of these things right now in these stores the way it stands right now? Yes. Um, I think... I think that's a problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so we need to do something. Mm -hmm. and, and online, yeah. like this is just as much available online mm. as well. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, along with this, as I'm reading this, is it correct to assume that after the request to remove CBD, products well gummy certainly is a, is a is a food to some people um that that has snuck back out into the stores after your request some time ago well i think the cbd gummy is um being looked at as a supplement and not really a food because we do have um, vitamin supplements that are in gummy forms that we don't regulate. So I think that's how they get a, they kind of get away with that. Seems oh. to me if we want to educate the public or give notice to the stores that we'd focus on the Kratom and the Delta yes. 8 and other synthetics. So I just want to circle back to what Cynthia said. Like, I totally agree. We need to do something now. Um, I would be more than happy to ask, a, you know, to write a letter and ask our stores to voluntarily remove the products from their store and not sell, and not sell them. I'd be more comfortable with that than asking them to require, you know, to be 21 and older and no self-service. Sure. I mean, it's it's voluntary. We're not yeah, going against any legal precedent here. Mm -hmm. We're just asking them to be good citizens. Mm -hmm. I, think it's, I think it's a great first move and it can be immediate. Mm -hmm. would, would you um, speak to the press about the fact that you have sent this letter out, not naming the store specifically, but saying that um, you've sent out a letter, I would do a press release. Press release to right. make sure because there are others. There are probably other places that sell products that we don't even know about. Right, right. Yeah, I wouldn't name the the individual stores in the press release. No, but, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. no. But just say that that you have sent this out to establishments that, that we're aware are, are selling these, and we've asked them to remove them due to then take some language from CDC mm -hmm. um, that, that sure I can support that mm -hmm. and alert the police about the THC sales. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Would someone like to co-author with me? Sure. I will. Okay, great. Thank you. I think when you say co-author, do you mean um, write the text or sign it? I can't hear you, Cynthia. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. When you say co-author, do you mean write the text or sign it? I didn't <laughs> hear you. What'd you say? Does she, oh. When you say co-author, do you mean help you write it or help just sign it? Oh, no, help me write it. Thanks, Joanne. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I don't know why you're going in and out. All right, so we are going to ask the stores to remove the Kratom and Delta 8, take it off their shelves, and then Meredith is going to contact the police regarding the THC issue. Do we need a motion for either of those, or is that just a request to the health department? I don't think there needs to be a motion for that. Okay. No, I don't think so. Just trying to pro provide some support there. Thank and you. When, <laughs> yeah, and when you write that, like, it should it be Delta 8 and similar synthetic products? To cover? Yeah, well, I'm going to definitely reach out to, I might, I mean, I might reach out to the DEA. I'm going to reach out to DA Sullivan. Um, I want to make sure that we're capturing as many of these products as we can without mm -hmm. having to name every single one of them, because I have a feeling there's there's more than we know with other alternative names. And I mean, and more to come. Like it's always, I like with tobacco, it's just this going to be this whack-a-mole system. I think in the world of um, designer drugs, uh, you can never name them fast enough. Right. So it's always um, best practice, as you know, Meredith, to say this substance, this substance, and others like them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By the time we get around to regulating it, there'll be a new one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm when I was actually um, making the agenda, I was trying to think of the language very carefully that I put in the language uh, in, into the agenda under the discussion. I think it was and other potentially harmful substances or something like that right. is what I used. Right. Yeah, I I do think in the um, category of the deltas, the delta family, the current delta family. Um, you can say other sy systemic uh, cannabinoids like them mm -hmm. if, you, if you're just focusing on that. That's more specific than the broad care category of other potentially harmful substances because then you're going to have to remove all the sugar. I mean, you know, I'm I'm being only a little <laughs> I'm being only a little facetious. I'm sort of trying to anticipate pushback on this, but yeah, yeah, a whole yeah. lot out there that's potentially harmful. But I think we're talking about a specific class here. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. I think we have a plan. Um, any other questions or comments on this? Thank you for gathering all that material. And thank you, Donna, for uh, doing those inspections. That's really interesting and, and helpful. You're very welcome. Thanks, Donna. Um, next subject, um, Meredith, you want to give uh, some updates? Can you do the minutes first? I need to take this phone call. I'm sorry. Okay, sure. I'm going to stop sharing. This um, yeah. Has everyone had a chance to look at the minutes? I can share on my screen. Bye. Let's see. I have. And? I have one suggestion. Let me see if I can, hold on, uh, share. Let's see if I can do that. Um, can you see this? Can you see that? Yes. Oh, great. All right, where are we? Um, Roman numeral four, commissioner updates, the one, two, three, four, five, DCC update. Mm -hmm. Since the opening on September 5th, I think the is not needed there. We have okay. had that many engagements. Okay, is that it? That's what I know. Okay, Cynthia, any other comments? Uh, no, no, thank you. Great, would anybody like to make a motion? I'll move to approve the minutes of uh, September, 
um, September 21st. 21st, as noted in the draft. Second. Uh, with that minor, with the minor uh, amendment? As, as amended. Uh, any other questions or comments? All in favor? Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Okay. Uh, Kelly, do, uh, do you have that? Yes, I do. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. And if Meredith is still on the phone, um, I just, maybe we should talk about the schedule. Our next meeting was supposed to be December 21st. Um, Meredith was wondering if we want to keep that date. That's right before Christmas. Um, we may or may not have, um, well, we may have some uh, information about wells. Amy, do you know when someone can come uh, to talk about wells? DEP hasn't gotten back to me yet, and that is something I, I was hoping for potentially today, but I gave them that other date or something, you know, in December. Right. Um, Just personally, I don't have any problem with the December 21st date. That may not be true for others. Uh, same. Meredith, we're, we're talking about uh, schedule, December okay. 21st. Cynthia, I'm sorry, I cut you off. Uh, same. I have no problems. So it depends on what we might need to talk about. Um, Meredith, you had some thoughts about that? I, I don't. I just want to make sure that um, we have a quorum. I'm so I think we'd have a quorum, but I don't know if we'll have everybody. Yeah. Okay. 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 So you want to keep it? Yep. Then we'll keep it. Okay. Okay. And if we don't have any updates or anything on the agenda, we'll cancel it. But if there's something cooking, then we'll we'll keep it. Okay. Okay. That sounds. Um. Good. All right. Do you want to give your update? Um, geez. Okay. So where are we? We're at staff. A lot of this, it's just a moving target. <laughs> um, we hired our, we, our fourth inspector was hired, um, last week, I think, and they start December 4th. So, um, our third inspector that we hired, a couple months ago starts December 21st. So our inspector team is officially full and we will be onboarding them the last week of November, first week of December. So we're super excited about that. Um, our public health- Can I ask what territory um, the inspectors cover? So Because it, now you do some work uh, yeah, regionally. 13, 14 communities, including ourselves. And I don't have the list in front of me. Amy, would you be able to rattle them off by any chance? I can try. Um, it would be, let me see, East Hampton, Granby, Amherst, Plainfield, Chester, Middlefield. Oh, I'm not covering too many. Hold Hatfield, on. Hatfield, <laughs> Hadley, Hadley, Chesterfield. Middlefield. Middlefield. Is that it? Worthington. And Worthington. Oh, yeah. Worthington. That's the west of Worcester. <laughs> What's that? I said everything west of Worcester. <laughs> so this is part of the Public Health Excellence Grant um, that we are in year three. Uh, the first two and a half years have been dedicated to... Um, building the infrastructure for public health nursing for all these communities. And uh, that program is going beautifully. We provide vaccine clinics. We do public health education at the senior centers. Um, we've done what other types of services? Oh. A whole myriad list yeah, of services. Um, 
what's in your medicine cabinet, all, all kinds of education, sun safety, tick safety. We do CPR classes for um, the municipalities. We just, yeah. Um, so that's great. And we have two regional nurses that primarily focus most of their efforts in, in those communities, but they also do um, work in Northampton too. I don't want to, I want to, I always say, I want to make sure that Northampton gets the services as well. Um, considering that we're taking on all the, the costs and the oversight of these, you know, of these grants. So the next phase of the public health excellence grant um, is to provide inspectional services. And we hired Angelica as our first regional inspector back in mm, July. Oh my God, I was going to say October. Actually, actually, no, actually August. August, okay, August. August. And she's been busy training with Amy and with Donna, um, primary focus being on food, because that's the first type of inspectional service we're going to roll out to our communities. Um, and she is actually working and doing food, uh, food service establishment inspections on her own now here in Northampton. So as soon as we have... Um, uh, a work plan on how to roll out these services to our, our communities that are part of our coalition. She'll be, I'm thinking by January 1st, um, hitting the ground running in those communities, providing at a minimum food service inspections, which is fantastic. The second- What did those communities do before we had, do they have their own um, inspectors or did not, not at all? So it varies. Um, like Hadley before um, hired an independent contractor to do 30% of their food inspections on a yearly basis. And that's all that got done where the mandates are you have to do them all twice a year. Um, some smaller rural communities that might only have one or two establishments, actually their board of health goes out and does them. Um, some communities like Hatfield had a 15 hour a week inspector uh, to cover all inspectional services. So it really varies across the board. East Hampton has a full-time inspector and so does Amherst. But um, where we would help them is to provide support when their inspectors are maybe out sick or on vacation, have time off. So the grant is written that you cannot um, uh, supplant any existing services you already provide as a community. We can only support it. So if East Hampton already has a full-time inspector, they can't get rid of the inspector and then just rely on the grant to do the inspections. So it's very clear. I'm not, you know, hopefully that doesn't happen, but I'm not sure what that's going to look like. So we just hired our second regional inspector. Her name is Jacqueline Prusak. She's going to start with us on December 4th. Can I ask a question about septic system inspections? Mm -hmm. Is there a backlog on those requests? I know. Don't think so. And what's the average turnaround from the time you receive the request? Well, so that's a that's a tricky question to answer because I mean we can get an application that doesn't have all the necessary documents. We could go back on a plan review multiple times before it satisfies the requirements. So it's really hard. Then if it's winter and they, you know, need a Title V inspection, they can't get it done. There's a lot of variables to that. But we're we're pretty expeditious. We have um, a contractor. Charlie Kanicki, who I think all of you or most of you know, mm -hmm. that's still doing, um, I want to say, probably 75% of our Title V work because our staff came in at a time where we couldn't get them credentialed the way that they need to be to do the work because of COVID. They weren't offering the courses and the training. Thank you for that. But Amy's going to take her test tomorrow. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> no pressure, I know. Donna took her test recently, correct? Yeah, in the spring. In the spring, yep. Yeah. So we're getting there, but we still want to make sure that we have a subject matter expert to help field questions, 
Um, there are innovative technologies. I've been out of the septic world for so long. I actually said to Amy, I think about a month ago, I could, you know, muddle through a plan review or do a field inspection, but so much is new in the field. And I haven't been, I haven't really even looked at a Title V plan thoroughly in seven years that I would have difficulties doing so. So I really, I rely on them to, to have the, you know, to have the institutional knowledge, but eventually um, the State Department of Public Health is going, they're creating these, these um, training hubs and they're supposed to have a subject matter expert to train all of the inspectors. So they are, they're going to have one in food, they're going to have one in housing, they're going to have one in septic. Um, these hubs aren't up and running yet, um, but they the, will have some support from the state to provide us the training. And I, I think the important part of that is that I, I, I will pass that test, but the field observations and the work that you do and what you see in the field is really what helps you, you know, learn all the nuances of uh, septic. So I'm looking forward to that too. Thank you. Yeah. And so um, we also yesterday um, hired a new public health nurse. Very excited about that. M. Rhodes Moulton, E.M. Mol Rhodes Moulton is their name, and they're going to be starting December 4th, and they're very excited. They come with um, a, a, a lot of experience, Suzanne, in harm reduction, um, which is fantastic. They're excited to help create um, a program for the nurses to work within the, the DCC. They did one of their internships. She was a... a um, uh, and she was in the accelerated VSRN program at UMass, double bat, uh, double bachelor. Is that how you say that? Two bachelors. I don't know how to, if I got that right, but she did her dual internship. Degree. Huh? Dual, degree. dual degree. Yeah. She did her internship, um, at healthcare for the homeless, um, in Springfield. So she's very well, um, familiar with, the population that will be serving in the DCC. So, I remember when there were no applicants. Yeah. For repeated postings. Oh, oh, we've been. It's been four months. I think we've had this job description up there. Mm -hmm. But on the flip side, um, we just got our a letter of resignation today from Elliot. Oh. So we're losing Elliot. Ouch. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So we're going to still be posting for a public health nurse, which is unfortunate. I, I literally yesterday I I did my team is full. Right, Amy? Like we just did that yesterday, like <laughs> for environmental health, that is. <laughs> um, so that yeah, that's really unfortunate. Um, other staffing, we um, we are going through the process of getting a shared service coordinator position rated through the city so we can hire um, for that position. And that person will help grow the program. The public health excellence program will be in charge of workflow, make sure that there's um, health equity woven into the program um, and making sure that the deliver uh, the grant deliverables are being met. So we're that posting will be up hopefully sooner than later. We are still looking for um, a, a substance use prevention director. This was formerly Kiko Malin who Malin who left for Amherst. Um, Michelle and I have been interviewing last week and this week. Um, so hopefully we'll have that position full. And then we are, we're growing our DCC team and hours of operation. So soon we'll be advertising for more community responders. What hours are you proposing for the DCC? Well, it really depends on how many staff I can pay for community responders that I can pay for. Um, Ideally, I'd like to be open till six or seven at night and then at least one weekend day a week. I'm not sure whether it's going to be Saturday or Sunday. What's happening is we're finding Mondays and Fridays are definitely our busiest days. Um, Fridays, the um, Mana and uh, Mana and um, the Resilience Hub are not open. 
So we're almost like a, a mini resilience hub on Fridays. And then, you know, they're not open on the weekends as well. So people not having these um, basic needs being met over the weekend, we tend to see more crisis events on Monday. So, you know, Fridays were more of a resilience hub. Mondays were more in mode of responding to crisis because of the lack of resources over the weekend. And I think that's just going to escalate as um, the conditions outside get colder. When you talk about resilience hub, I thought that wasn't open yet. So Mana, who is our soup kitchen, um, during COVID, um, just organically opened, you know, its doors to become a resilience hub and does provide services and connections and resources. It's very limited. They are under resourced, overtaxed, um, and they're, you know, they're only open, you know, maybe five or six hours a day, four days a week. But they do have those types of services in there. And community action was in there um, in that space at one point as well to be the organizers of the the um, the resilience hub. But the resilience hub eventually will be larger and be in the church. And the DCC will be there too. The DCC will be there too. Mm -hmm. and how how are we doing with that? construction? Yeah, so I do believe the city has signed a contract with the um, architect firm that, um, you know, uh, put in a proposal that fit the needs for the RFP that was out there. Um, Michelle was on the committee to review all the proposals. They had their official kickoff meeting last week, which I went to. There are still, I left there with way more questions than answers. Um, we need way more space than what's available and what the city, how the city really wants to use that space. So there's a lot to figure out still about that. I say safely, you know, um, I, I'm not banking on anything sooner than two years for that to be open. And they talk about maybe phasing in um, certain parts of the hub, you know, maybe opening up the first floor for the hub to be open and then wait on the second and the third floor. But, you know, um, the my perspective on that is if the first floor, the ground floor, where the resilience hub is going to be and DCC and we're having people that are coming in with crisis needs and um, mental health and behavioral health issues, the last thing that we would want is there to be construction and noise on the second floor above. I just don't see how that, we need to look at this space as it's not only being designed, but as it's being constructed and retrofitted with a trauma-informed lens. So I, there's a lot to be worked out there still. So it's moving forward. <laughs> That's about all I got. I think, you know, if you ask the mayor's office a year, maybe a year and a half, but um, you know me, I'm always, you know, hopefully optimistic. I'm, and I'm saying probably closer to two years. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and you had uh, some awards. Oh, I think that I think that was left over from last month. I'm sorry. I let you know that we got the COSEP award last month, the $1.3 million COSEP award to continue our DART work, but we're reimagining what um, post-overdose response w looks like. No longer, you know, having a recovery coach and a police officer doing the work together, but bringing in what we envision now as a community responder who specializes in substance use um yeah OUD um mm -hmm. to to be part of that team um so we're we're just thinking about what that looks like we we got the award we're going back to the funders and this is a DOJ Department of Justice award um you know making sure that what was written into the proposal 
the end results are the same, but we do need to do amendment based off our reimagining what it's going to look like. And then what else is on there? Oh, DCC Community Responder Awardee. Oh, let me share my screen. Hold on, let me bring this up. Okay. Can you all see my screen? Yes, yes. Yes, okay. So um, this is Carlos. He is a DCC community responder and um, he was nominated by Rep. Lindsay Sabadosa for the uh, 2023 Latino Excellence Award. And him um, and uh, Kristen Rhodes went down to the State House to accept this award. I want to think about uh, two weeks ago. It was such an honor. But um, he was represent. He was nominated not only as his work um, that he does for the community, the DCC, but for work that he has also done in his previous life and experience. So I just wanted to share that with you, and I'll send the link out so you can actually see all the um, awardees. But that was quite an honor. We didn't do um, Carlos. Carlos is he's he's an amazing person. Um, he, his heart drives him to do this work. Um, he doesn't want any accolades. He was actually very embarrassed and didn't want anyone to know about this. So um, with that being said, um, we didn't do any type of really big announcement about it. Um, and the mayor's office asked me if I was going to do a press release. And my answer to them was no, um, unless they really wanted me to, because a Carlos would shy away from that, but I also feel like it takes away from our other DCC community members that are doing the work um, at the same level that Carlos is doing. So, but this is really an honor and Carlos is a spectacular man. You might've met him when you um, came to the open house that day. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. Great. And I'll share that so you can read his bio. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, I think that's the end of our agenda. Uh, I did wanna mention um, that I had a email conversation with um, Alan Seewald about our open meeting policy that we made, I think January of last year. Uh, and he thought it was illegal uh, because we had added a statement that we expect people to be courteous and respectful or something like that. He said, that part is illegal. Um, and um, um, I asked him uh, after what apparently happened at city council recently, I asked him in what ways we were allowed to limit um, public comment. Uh, and one thing that we are allowed to do um, and I think city council is considering as well, um, is to ask people who are speaking to, to uh, only speak on topics that are on the agenda for that evening. Um, that may not be the ideal way of having public comment, um, but that is one way we are allowed to limit public comment if we wanted to. Um, the city charter does uh, require that we have public comment. Um, but as we already did, we can limit how much time each person speaks and we can limit, which we didn't do, um, the total time of public comment session. Um, so I think I'll bring that back next time we meet so we can amend that. Meredith, do you have any other thoughts about that? Um, yeah, I, I, I did read that. Um, and I feel like you know, I've, I've been doing this for 20 years now. Um, and in any role, in any community that I was in, I always attended the Board of Health meetings. And a, much of the information that we received that drove some of our work came from the community. And it wasn't about the topic that was on the agenda. It was just 
a topic that could be happening in our community that we're not, we don't know about. And if we limited public comment to just what's on the agenda, we could be missing things. So I have concern about that. Um, I'd like to explore other options if the board agrees with that. We don't have to limit, we don't have to limit it at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just inquiring okay. about ways that we could limit it if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. um, so last time we, we made this policy, we decided not to limit the total time. We did decide to limit it to two minutes per person. Okay. Um, so we can talk about it next time. We'll bring it next time. And the reason we can't, if someone is, you know, um, speaking hate rhetoric, we can't just mute them is because of violation of freedom of speech. Is that correct, Joanne? I think that's what Alan says. Yep. Just because we may not like what they're saying. If someone threatens violence, they can be removed from the meeting. Um, and that's, uh, or have threatening behavior. Um, mm -hmm. But um, speech is protected. I was wondering that um, at one point in time or sporadically, we say, state your name and your address. Is that okay? I think you're allowed to ask that. Um, so I think we're shying away from address um, because we don't yeah. want the public to know where people live. Yeah. Um, it was, I was, Amy and I were at actually the Belchertown Board of Health meeting and there was some public comment about the Kratom when the Kratom hearing opened up and there was someone who spoke um, during public comment. And it was really, it was kind of awkward. Let me just give you the scene. He was wearing um, Kevlar vest and had a gun and uh, the whole half an hour prior to, I'm like, what is this gentleman going to say? I'm thinking he's going to be a proponent to, you know, have regulations for this, like he's law enforcement. So anyways, he finally gets a turn to speak up during public comment. And he said that he is national security for such and such. And um, he is a Kratom user and he starts to speak and the board goes, excuse me, sir, 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 can you state your name and address? And he gives us the name and I forget what his name was. And they go, okay, can you state your address? And he just looked you know, had a blank look on his face and the board chair of the board goes, are you from Belcher town? And <laughs> just like that. And, and the gentleman goes, um, uh, no, I, 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 I work, I travel for work, but my, um, residence is Kentucky or Texas or what, whatever it was. So, you know, the gentleman from the American Kratom Association had put planted people in the audience for public comment that he knew was going to speak in favor of uh, not regulating Kratom, but that just threw him off his game completely and he couldn't even speak. <laughs> but this brings me back to like, I don't really think we should be asking for street addresses. Maybe there's a way that we can have people identify you know, are, are, are you a Northampton resident or what's your affiliation or something like that? That was a long story. Just I'm wondering. Yeah. yeah, I'm wondering if we if we needed to, if we could limit it to only people who live in Northampton, that wouldn't necessarily include all business owners or anything like that. But I'm wondering if there's another way to mm -hmm. limit speakers. It's public comment. Yeah. Well, I guess, you know, that's that's a decision that we need to make is do we want to limit it um, or, or not? I'm glad, I'm glad Ellen gave the guidance um, because it helps to explain to me why we, we're not kind and courteous anymore because it's <laughs> illegal to be that. <laughs> so now I get it. Now I know why society is fractured. <laughs> I know we may go to in-person meetings at some point, but um, I know it can feel like forever if someone's yelling at you. 
but it is only 120 seconds of <laughs> a lot of time. So I guess the question for myself is, is my skin thick enough to sit there for 120 seconds and listen to somebody yell at me? I think that in a way comes with the territory. Although I have to admit that there is, that drifting into hate speech is something I think we need to find a way to deal with. Um, just, just labeling something hate, one person's hate speech is another person's free speech. So I think that that's uh, an area that needs some more definition, perhaps even some more guidance from Alan. Yeah, so I so when he I said, is there any way we could deal with, you know, if we had someone or our city council had several people spewing hate speech, and he said, no, that's people have a right to free speech, and he said, welcome to government. So <laughs> um, yeah. on that, um, does anybody have anything else they want to bring up? Suzanne will maintain her role as timekeeper. <laughs> I think we need a raise. <laughs> <laughs> a double double everyone's salary. Double everyone's salary. <laughs> I want 10 times what I'm getting now. <laughs> All right. Would anyone like to make a motion? Move to adjourn. Uh, second. Any discussion? All in favor? Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you. We'll see you on December 21st unless we have a very light agenda, in which case we'll cancel.